We're actually going to start with uh, trying out an exercise that I do usually before I start an educational game with uh, children. So, to my help, I have uh, Petty Carlson. And this, for this game, you need to be two or two or three people working together. So, just look at each other sitting next to one and be like, hey, we're going to team up. And we team up. We team up. Okay. And first, I'm going to explain to you how this uh, exercise is run. And it starts like this. I'm going to pretend doing something. And then Petter. Uh, what are you doing? I'm... Uh, I'm... Uh, I sc I'm climbing a mountain. And she is definitely not climbing a mountain here. She is just making up something. So I will start climbing a mountain. What are you doing? I am rowing a boat on a canal. What are you doing? I am giving birth. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, so you see the point. So I would like you to rise up and do this in your pair for just one minute. So I'm going to talk a little bit about LARP as a part of the learning process. And why I'm talking about this today is because, uh, as Ellen said, I am the founder and director of Livexpon, uh, which translates to the LARP workshop. We are a company in Sweden running educational LARP mostly, both on children's spare time and in their formal education in school. We focus on 11 to 16 year olds, so that's what we mostly do, but we do work with grown-ups and younger children also, but that is my main experience from that age. We work with between 2,000 and 4,000 students each year, and we create between 50 to 70 new LARP days, days each year. That means more than once a week we create a new LARP day, according to this, which is true. One interesting thing about this I would like to tell you about is something that happened between 2010 and 2012, three years. During these three years, I, had, I got uh, support from uh, an organization called Playing for Change uh, to start up Livex Stalin. We have already started, but they gave me support to sort of continue working with this idea. During that time, we had to report uh, each year on sort of our social impact of what we did. So we send out questionnaires to most of the students that we work with those, during those three years. And one of the questions in these anonymous questionnaires to 11 to 17, 16 year olds was the question, what else have you learned? And that question came in the end, and it was not about like the school subject that we tried to teach them about, but it was, have you learned anything else? And spontaneously, those uh, who answered this, 20% of them said something like, I've became braver, I dare to talk more now, I dare to do more things now. 20% of 11 to 16 year olds came up with that answer on their own. This is something I think is extremely interesting when you talk about educational LARPs. We will get a lot of things happening that is not just a subject that we're trying to teach. And one of those things is self-development. Uh, so, what I'm trying to say is all LARP can be educational, but for it to become an educational LARP is LARP when the writers or the organizers and or one or more of the players have the explicit intention of the LARP being educational. So, on this talk I'm actually going to focus on when the writers or organizers have, and mostly also, of course, the participants focus on it becoming an educational LARP, and of course, on a specific subject, something specific, a goal, a learning goal they have for just a specific LARP. But why would you do this? Why would you use LARP as a part of education? I mean, we have other methods. Well, there's a lazy answer to this, and this is the answer I tell a lot of the times when I, I talk with people who question this. And the answer goes like this. 
imagine uh, uh, learning about the French Revolution in school. You're 15 year old. You're sitting in the classroom and you hear the teacher talk about the French Revolution. You might read something on the, on the board or you might read something from a book. What we're doing is that we're putting them, we're putting them into the costume of a French revolutionary. We're putting them into a house where they open the door to the tavern and they stand there as a French revolutionary shouting out, long live the revolution. And in this group, in this building, we have a group of people sitting, pretending to be hiding noblemen, dressed up as peasants, trying to flee away from these French revolutionaries. We have the tavern maiden, who actually tries to smuggle for money, French uh, uh, noblemen across the canal to, the, to England. And we have a lot of different characters actually portraying different aspects of the French Revolution. This is the lazy answer. This is, you can understand that this has a greater effect this is more interesting to be a part of than sitting in a classroom for most people. There may be more extensive answer to why uh, is some of these things. There are more, but these are some. One of the things uh, to why we use LARP as a part of education is that we are designed to remember I stories, a story where I have participated, that I have been a part of. When we are part of a story, the brain remembers this story for a longer time and better. And it really helps. I mean, we do want the students to remember what we taught them in school. We just don't want them to remember it to the test and then it's over. We want them to really learn. Also, it gives a chance for some students who don't fit in that well to schools. In every class, you have someone who don't fit into sitting down and listening or just writing down or reading information. They need something more, they need to move, they need to be active, they need to talk all the time. They don't fit in so well in the normal classroom. And this is giving them a chance to show off or try to learn their way. Also, one of the most, most uh, normal responses we get from teachers is that after a LARP or during a LARP, the teachers come up to us and be like, I have never seen that student do that before. One of the most normal reactions. In a, in a LARP, you get the alibi and you also get the possibility to do something that you usually don't do. One story of this is uh, we're, uh, we're in a big rock building. You're, it's huge, it's bigger than this room. It's really damp and it's really dark. And they are pretending that it's a game about, uh, about English, but also about um, uh, sort of gender roles. But it's, uh, it's about uh, a sci-fi LARP, and they have come into this cargo ship, this spaceship, and they are researchers and soldiers there. There are 60 students playing this LARP. And they are milling about, and they have found small, what might be alien eggs and they are super disgusting. And a lot of things have started happening during this LARP. And at one point, one boy, he is 15 years old, he walks up uh, on a staircase and he enters a balcony, which is sort of a stage over a whole cave area. It's huge and it has almost as, as many as you are standing below listening to what he has to say. And in very good English, he describes, we have found alien eggs. This is how they contaminate people. This is what we should do. This is how it spreads in excellent English. Afterwards, the teacher come up to me and says, this boy never speaks at English lessons. This boy, at this moment, raised his vocal English grade a step because he showed he can do this. And then she actually, the teacher went up to the boy and said, why, why don't you speak in class? You're really good at that. You should speak out more. Why, why did you, you spoke so much in this LARP? And he looked at her, a little teenager. I was like, well, uh, well uh, it said in my character, I was really talkative. So I just had to talk. <laughs> and it, just, it gave him the perfect alibi to just try out because he had the knowledge. He just didn't feel like he should do that in the classroom setting. So this is some of the why. Um, concrete understanding is also something that we get a lot of feedback from students in school that they're like, why should I learn this math thing? 
What is the use of this math thing that you're trying to teach me? It's really boring and I don't want to learn it. A LARP, you can easily put it into a situation where it is needed, where you can understand how do I actually, when, when is the situation I need to use this math? And if you want to learn more about the math LARP, I can tell you about the LARP we did uh, that is according to math. But now it's time for you to do some work. Uh, and I will give you about two minutes to do this. What I want you to do is that I want you to fill in this list. This is just a couple of things of why, uh, why it's a good idea to use LARP in the part of the learning process. You could do it in your head, but preferably do it on paper. And just, it can be your ideas why it's a good idea. It doesn't have to be the research right answer, just why you think it would be a good idea. So two minutes to think of it yourself or on paper, preferably write it down if you can. And then I want you to choose one, well, if you only have one, you choose that one. But if you have several, choose one that you like the most and share it with the person sitting next to you. I love that someone just helped me with that. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, if you want to talk about your whys with me later on, please do so. But now I'm just going to continue. LARP is a part of learning process. Uh, and this is a very important part to understand. You can't go into a classroom and just LARP and then set go. Uh, it doesn't work this way. Uh, we need to uh, uh, use it as a part of a learning process. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit about what parts of the learning process where the learning happens for different subjects. And this is a model that is, of course, never perfect, as models never are, but it's a way of thinking that might help you when you construct a learning process for, with a LARP in it. If, I, if I'm, I'm going to start with categorizing different kinds of learning, uh, and what I mean by these. Personal, the first one is personal development and group development. What I mean by this is like things like understanding more about yourself and how you work in a group, or maybe group development as in better cooperation or better at listening to each other or better at solving problems together. That is a category of things you can learn through LARPing. And then the second one is processes. What I mean by this is processes, for example, is calls an event. For example, in political systems, what is a, it could be a process of what happens when you vote, where does the vote go, and who uses it afterwards, and what happens to it next, and so on and so on. A process can also be sort of a hi historical events, like the French Revolution, as I talked about before. It started somehow, and then it was a series of events that followed it that is a process. And the third one is factual uh, learning. It's about facts, like um, different years, or maybe it could be about different ways of running a government and so on. And I'm going to start by uh, talking about an example and then go in through where sort of the learning happens in these kind of uh, learning categories. And this is a picture from Snaphane that a third of the group has played and the rest of you are going to play. And this one is about personal and group development. It was mainly uh, designed for that uh, in the beginning. The LARP has a world setting in an alternative Sweden. This Sweden is a new democracy. It's not really a democracy. And the government is really running it very hard, very hard towards the civilians. There's a freedom fighter or terrorist group called the Partisans or Snapphane in Swedish. They are opposing the government in a very harsh way, and it's a civil war. In these games, the scenario is, there's four different scenarios, and you're just going to play one. But in this scenario, these people are set uh, together with a very hard moral dilemma in the LARP. Uh, and there's no right and wrong answers, no right and wrong solutions. It's just very, very hard and very stressful for, to solve this situation. Uh, and this is the, the learning goal we're aiming for here, is talking about rights and wrong, about compassion, about bravery, about what people do when they, when they are in very, very extreme situations. And the learning process, if you think about the processes before the LARP, during the LARP and after the LARP, in uh, personal and group development, if that's the focus of learning, 
Most of the learning happens both in all these three places. Before the lab, it happens in the workshops where we workshop and try to use like the break technique, the safety rules, and we understand more about that. We get to cooperate and we get to become a better group playing this LARP together. But it also happens during the LARP. And one of the most important things here is something that I've written, cooperation and acceptance. In a regular Swedish school classroom, uh, the most students are afraid of when you say they're going to LARP is that, are everyone going to do this? And the answer to this is yes, most of them will do it. Uh, um, in a year of LARPing, I have about three or four who, don't, who skip out of the LARP when we do school LARPs. Uh, but the, that seeing during the LARP that everyone does it is a very good thing for the group process in that classroom. Seeing that everyone cooperates and actually accept doing this together, putting themselves a little bit on the risk here. And also being someone else is very good for group development and personal development. Trying out different kind of characters or roles that you can try out being with the alibi of doing it in the LARP. Especially with young kids, children, kids who don't not really sure who am I, whom I'm going to be in my life. To get to try out being someone else for a while and be like, maybe, maybe I'll take a part of that and, and, and take a part of that into my life. And then you also have after the LARP. After love, you do reflections. What happened? What did you do? Why did your character do that? Uh, how did you feel when you made your character do that? And how did that work? You reflect upon your own, uh, your own uh, experience. And also, you do parallels to reality. Uh, does this happen anywhere in the world? How does this affect the people that live in those situations and circumstances? That's the first category. And actually, we're going to do a little exercise. So I want you to stand up again. And I'm going to show you three signs. And first, I'm just going to explain to you what you're going to do when I show the signs. When I show one, you're going to point forward and say, it was you. When I do two, you are going to say, no, I'm innocent. And when I do uh, three, you are going to die in some kind of way. Okay, so you get to choose. Maybe there's gas, or maybe you got shot, or maybe your neighbor stabbed you in the back. Uh, however you want to die. But when I do the signs, you do that. So repetition, we're just going to try the two first ones and not the dying part, okay? It was <laughs> you. No! no. Okay, good. Now, now I'm going to do it with some tempo. No, 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 Thank you very much. Please uh, awake, arise. Uh, I don't know the spell for that, but I should. That's four. Yeah, yeah. Come, come to life again. So, okay, we're moving on to the next category. The next category is processes, to understand a process. And a very, very common educational LARP in this is uh, political processes. And this LARP is one that we have constructed, that is called Good Intentions. In Good Intentions, it aims for 14-year-olds, uh, and they are, uh, they are playing different countries. So there's like three playing uh, a certain country, and three playing a different country, and three playing a different country. Uh, they're all fictional countries, it's not real countries, but they're all based on very real facts. So there's no Russia or France or Sweden, but it's uh, something totally different. And in this, uh, in this LARP, they, do it, they play it uh, several times. And the first couple of times, they play it as sort of a board game. They don't really play the character. They're just playing sort of the board game person of doing 
um, Goldavian, for example, one, it's one of the fictional countries. And they have, a, they have a certain amount of money, a certain amount of war power, a certain amount of political influence. And in the board game, they need to sort of build up their resources. And they do that by negotiating with another country. And they get a ne negotiation uh, task, and it says if you manage to get that country to do this, you get this much, or you lose this much. So they have alternatives to try to reach. The worst alternative to reach is no decision. And that's the worst alternative for both countries. Uh, so they always try to reach a, de reach a decision. So they play this board game thing, not really paying characters, for two or three times. And then they're sort of committed to their country. And the last part of it is an actual LARP, where they play sort of a, a world conference. And they're trying to resolve different questions. And this is from this picture from them, where they start the LARP with having sort of a startup speech, where they talk about what, the, what kind of issues they are most passionate about from the country. Uh, so this is uh, how about processes. This one is, uh, so during the LARP they can t learn about context, about connections, events, costs and effects. Uh, and after the LARP, I mean for this LARP for example, it is, it's very real sort of how it's happening, but it's not, we make it less complex so that they will understand it easily and be able to play it because they're not so old and we don't have so much time. But so afterwards we reflect on what do you think would happen, is this reasonable that it would happen for real? And also we draw parallels to reality. Is this, uh, and all these countries are based on different kind of countries for real. So they get to do that. The third uh, of the learning categories was factual knowledge. And in this we learn actual facts, for example about geography. This LARP is about geography that you see here, Mission Around the World. And it's about, they are actually traveling in different black box scenes to different countries, trying to learn about resources and how that affects human uh, living in the country. And in this part, the, the half of the group, half of the class, are playing inhabitants in the country. Those players are very heavily instructed on what to do in the different, uh, different LARPs. And half of the group are playing uh, journalists coming to that country uh, trying to investigate an environmental issue. So uh, it's a very, it's a black box LARP with many different scenes and very heavily scripted for some of them. This, they actually, they actually go to Greenland, they go to China, they go to Mali, they go to uh, Brazil and learn about those with factual knowledge. But what you actually need to think about here is that what the, most of the actual learning happens before when we do research for the LARP and after the LARP when they reflect about it. But during the LARP, not so much, they, they get used to things they've learned in the research, but it's, not, it's very, very hard for them to improvise correctly when they use factual knowledge. It's very hard for them to sort of really, really go into how is it to be uh, a rice farmer in China. They don't know that they're, they're 11 year olds from Sweden. So it's more important to talk about, they let them improvise and let them try it out, but afterwards talk about, well, maybe what, you, what happened here wasn't that realistic. It happens more like this, to problemize it and talk more about it. But it also, also made them very interested to research that subject more after the LARP. For factual knowledge, you can also use something else that is very interesting. And this is because now we talked, they are learning about China, they went to China. But you can also learn about something with a transferred context, which means that if, for this LARP, for example, the next Mafia Boss, this is a LARP we run at companies. Uh, and in those companies, we teach them about uh, equality issues. And in Sweden, you need an equality plan if you work in a workplace with 24 uh, workers or more. And uh, in this, we start this educational day with a LARP called Next Mafia Boss. In this LARP, there is Family Anderson and Family Johansson. Family Anderson uh, run a specific part of the Mafia and Johansson another part of the Mafia. And now the Anderson Mafia Boss has quit. And a new boss needs to be chosen. 
And uh, of course, the boss has always been an Anderson. But, uh, but that it doesn't have to be. I mean, it's equally fair to choose neither Anderson or Johansson. This LARP is heavily scripted. All the characters have sort of like things they should do in different scenes. And what it does is that in every, in every part of the LARP, things happen that are equal to what happened in the workplace for gender issues. So after the LARP, we have a lecture telling them about uh, pay rates, for example, and how, how that happens, equal or not equal in a company. And it's very, uh, and the same thing happened in LARP, but to these different mafia families. And that is what we call the transferred uh, context. And in this part, the most of the learning actually happens after the LARP, when you reflect about this, when you have the lecture afterwards about it, and when you research about it and draw parallels to reality. So, to summarize it, uh, we have these di three different things. We have personal development and group development. We have the factual knowledge and processes. And I have bolded and underlined the different things where most of the learning process happens. And the thing they all have in common is that it happens after. A LARP is a super important, very good way of doing it, but if you haven't got time to spend on after work, it won't be a good educational process. Okay. Before I continue from here, I'm going to do another exercise. So please rise up. So, uh, now you're going to, together with the, the one or two people standing next to you, play a short scenario. You are playing the scenario of ten years later from now. So, it's been ten years, you've been to the Dark Fighter Summer School, and now it's been ten years, and you meet these same people again. And you're going to talk about what happened after this. Did you go and go do great LARPs, or did you develop something great? And I want you to fantasize about the brightest ever possible future. So you're meeting this and be like, hi, it was such a long time ago, 10 years, and what have you been doing since then? And be like, I've done this great thing. And the other one be like, I've done this great thing. Okay, you understand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope all your bright futures will come true. <laughs> this is one of the methods we actually use in after work. After people have played LARP, one of the things we do is that we do a drama exercise which is 10 years later. And we of course can do the 10 years before this happened. So if they played a LARP about Snapane, maybe what, what, what it, was it like 10 years later in this neighbor building? And they get to talk a little bit about it beforehand. Now you just went and that was great. But they get to talk about it beforehand, just discuss what, what's plausible, what might have happened. And then they try to play it for each other. But there's so many different other methods, so I'm not going to go through them all. What I'm going to do is then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the mixing desk of LARP and how that ties into educational LARP. Mostly, it is very much the same things that you should think about as the faded talks go through generally. I mean generally when you do LARP design. But a lot of the time when you are doing LARP design for uh, educational purposes, you will do it with people who have not LARP before. And then there's some extra things to think about and I'm going to show you. This is like a test, so we will see if it works, all right? Can you in the back go like, yes, I'm hearing you. Yes, I'm hearing you. Wonderful, you are very uh, compliant. <laughs> all right, so this is the mixing desk, and I'm going to do sort of a fader moving around here, all right? Uh, over here we have communication styles. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm going to go this, through this quite quickly. Communication styles, you can use verbal physical here. It's the same thing as in regular LARPs. You can try it both in education LARPs. I don't see any difference. Pressure on players though. Uh, as we talked about before, if you put a lot of hardcore pressure, 
it will be very hard for them to learn things because they will freeze instead of learn things. So go more for pretense here, I would say. Bleed in, this is very hard to talk about because when you do it with only a group who've never LARPed before and no one is showing the way of behaving as a character except like two uh, of us LARP uh, pedagogues doing it, uh, they will try to play the character they're given but they will sort of very easily slip into themselves. And a lot, lot, lot of the times we do sometimes just give them, you are the farmers. And then they actually play mostly the social role of themselves, but they play the function, the role of a farmer. You see the difference? Good. So somewhere in here. Uh, play and motivation. You can try both. We've tried both. It's very interesting to see what happens. Um, so I would say it's somewhere in between, but it could be both. Openness and transparency. Uh, I would say that this is also something you can try the, the fader uh, to set on different levels. Uh, it depends on the learning goal, of course. But you can try, try it uh, to set it on different ways. Here is something that I find very interesting. Uh, sometimes when I started doing education LARPs, I thought it was a super good idea to give the students the right to own their own character, make up their own character, do an interesting character for you. Completely failed. <laughs> this is because when you haven't LARPed before, you have no idea what's going to be an interesting character for LARPing. It's very, very hard to understand how this medium works before you even tried it. And then giving that power to, to the players was sort of destructive because it wouldn't give them an interesting experience. Also, a lot of the time you want to use this power, this fader down to organizer, to, to, uh, to do a certain learning goal. I mean, you want them to, to experience a certain thing because you have a learning goal of doing that. So then you put it maybe very close to organizer. Game Master style, we haven't talked about here already, but I'm going to say that we uh, at Livexladen, we are almost always up here. We are super, super, super active. Uh, and that is because we are the only ones who know how to LARP. So we will go in, we will initiate scenes, we will try different things, then we try to hand it over. But we, we will be very there, very present, very much pushing events all the time. But, you, um, but it could be lowered, but it's, uh, we, do, we are much up there. Uh, and game mechanics, we haven't talked about this here uh, yet. But game mechanics, we have, tried, uh, we have tried most of the fader. It's super interesting. We have been super intrusive. We have been, uh, we have been uh, very discreet. So um, play with that fader, it's a lot of fun. A lot of times people think that maybe they can't handle it. Uh, because they're so new, so they can't handle a bunch of techniques. But that's not my experience. My experience is that it works splendidly. So you can try it all. Uh, I'm not going to... Well, environment. This, of course, after you haven't had a presentation of these feathers, this might become a little bit complicated right now. And of course you will remember all this when the fader comes up, so you will understand later on. Uh, but environment. I would say it's also, you can put it somewhere on the fader, it's not super important. But something that is very, very good, in my experience, is to give them some kind of costume. This, this helps with the alibi, the alibi of being someone else, of trying out a different character. So give them some kind of costume to show, I'm not myself now, I'm doing something else. Uh, so, so probably here. But also, it could be very, very helpful to be in a different environment than the classroom. Especially if you want to do group development or personal development things. Because you step out of your normal zone of behavior and you step into another location. Loyalty to world? Well, I would say we're up at playability. This means that we might sometimes, when we do a historical LARP, we might sometimes say, everyone plays everything. It doesn't matter if you are a man, a female, or not binary. We, we don't care about that. You can play whatever you would like to play. Uh, so, you, so they get to choose a lot of the time. 
So we go more to playability, but at the same time we have to think a little bit about plausibility, especially if we also want to teach them about the certain circumstances in history or somewhere else. So it's somewhere in between. Uh, but we need to make sure that everyone in a classroom can play this game since it's not voluntary. Yes? What do you mean by not binary? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, some people perceive their gender to not be sort of male or female, uh, so, and that's a binary view of, uh, of gender, that you're either female or male. Non-binary don't perceive themselves as being uh, neither or, they can be a little bit of both. Or, and uh, there's more things in there, but that's the simple explanation. Thank you for asking. Uh, representing of theme, this is a little bit new to me myself, so I'm not going to get into this very much. But I'm going to talk a little bit about action later on. And, but I think we are very much in the middle of this one too. Now I need to take everyone down, so now you just uh, remember everything I've said here. <laughs> and now we're also going to play a game, so while I'm doing this you can stand up again. Something that I'm really uh, too bad to be true at is assessment. But if you're doing an educational LARP, make sure to think about how will we assess this? How will we be possible in school to grade this part of the learning process? How will we know that we reach our learning goals? How will we know as organizers? And how will you know as participants that I actually learned something by this? We usually use the teachers here. And why we do this is because that we come into this and do this once with students we don't know. We have no idea where they are when we start. So we can't assess if they developed or not. So we, we do it in collaboration with the teachers that we talk about them before. This is what we're going to do. Do you have an idea how you would like to assess this? And then we help them facilitate that assessment. Is that clear? Great. So, for the last th four minutes, I'm going to go through my uh, ten pieces of advice that I like the best. Goal and purpose. If you're doing an educational LARP, you need to be super clear. What are you going to learn? Why are you going to learn this? Super, super clear. Check this like 20 times through the design process. Second one is what I just talked about. How will we assess this? How is it possible to assess this game? Where does the assessment happen? And those are all pictures from our educational games. The next one is target audience. You need to design for the people you're going to play with. And 11 classes of 11 year olds will not like the same games as you do. I promise you that. You need to design for those you're playing with. So be sure that you're not making something that you think is fun, but that they will think it fun, interesting or learning. Keep it interesting. In, in Swedish we call this where's the must, but that doesn't really work in English. And so I say oomph, uh, but I don't know what the right word is. But it has to still be interesting. You can't just focus, or you should of course also focus on the educational aspect. But if the game isn't interesting to participate in, it won't be an eff effective method. The fifth one, you design the before part, the LARP, and the after part, with focus on the after. You need to design all these aspects, not just LARP. Because if you just design LARP, you have not done an educational LARP. Be safe and trustworthy. When I step into a classroom, especially with teenagers, most of them are like, oh my god, what the hell is she going to do with us? <laughs> and then, I need to be super safe because I'm, tr I'm, I'm asking them to do something that is very outside the comfort zone, that might be socially scary for them to do with their classmates, and then I need to be super safe and trustworthy person. Don't trick them, don't try to be super funny, be safe. And be super clear. It is very, very hard to understand what you're supposed to do. Uh, if you've never tried it before, and together with other people who've never tried it before. You need to be clear in your instructions, you need to be clear in your design. 
And this is also part of it. Help them understand what they can do. How do you help them? Because the most common questions you will have is, okay, I understood, but what should I do? What, what should I do in the lab? I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. This you need to help them with. You can do it by writing playable characters. You can do it by making a very obvious design. This is where you go if you want to do this. This is where you go if you want this to happen. And this is the character, the very obvious character that you should go to if you want the quest for this thing. Make it very clear, help them understand that. Give them responsibility. We've had great success with second or third time LARPers in educational purposes being helping out with running the game for us, together with us, as with extra responsibility. Please ask me more about this, this is super interesting. And last but not least, expect beginners to be beginners. They're, they're not going to play in the same way as a group of experienced LARPers are, especially if it's only new LARPers in a group. It's going to be different. Be okay with that. They are trying their best usually. So don't expect them to be, it is a skill and it is something that you train up to do. Don't expect them to be on their levels. It's alright. Thank you very much.